In this video, I wanted to break down the pixel display prototype I recently constructed, which you've seen on stream and in a recent short. The motivation to build such a panel came down to wanting to add some visual difference behind me during streams, and also because I fell down a YouTube rabbit hole of others doing a similar sort of project, and I really wanted to link one up to Unity. So in this video, I will start with the construction, talk about the electronics, then finish on the Unity setup. But first a note, this is a prototype and it's not a finished project. I plan on slowly building this up with something a little bit more streamlined visually and with several programs to manage it, including some games. So if you're interested in this project and you wanna see its progression and maybe you haven't done so already, consider subscribing to the channel. So let's dive straight into the construction. I started with a bit of MDF board for the backing. I chose a black surface to match the black LED strips I had acquired. Next, we have those LED strips and I went for some WS2812B strips with a separation of 12 millimeters. I had decided on a 32 by 32 layout so I got enough strips to cover this amount. On top of the LEDs, I 3D printed a set of offsets to both separate the LEDs and work as a distance to the diffuser panel. These had a notch cut out in one direction in order to lay on top of the LEDs and avoid light leaking. Now I originally printed a test piece in white which added to the diffusion but led to bleeding of light through the plastic so I ended up going back to black PLA. The height of these offsets was determined by powering a few LEDs laying underneath the diffuser panel. I put cardboard separators at differing heights until I got a level of diffusion that I was satisfied with. After the offsets, the diffuser panel comes down. This is about 10 millimeters thick and happened to be a cutoff piece from a previous sign I had in the workshop. Lastly, to keep everything held together, I had 3D printed some clamps for the corners and midsections. These bolted behind the backboard and on top of the diffuser. For the version one, I plan to make these the full length of one side and overlapping in order to give a cleaner aesthetic, but still keep the rigidity of the panel. For the wiring, I drilled three small holes on each end of the LED strips in the backboard to feed the wire through, then performed a lot of soldering to connect them all together. The data wire was wrapped back to each new line of LEDs and the ground was connected in a zigzag pattern on all the strips. Now periodically, I connect five volt inputs. If you're planning on taking on this project, I suggest looking at how much your LED strips draw and doing the math on where to insert new power input. Just make sure to connect up all the grounds. And just to note, if you don't do research properly on how to connect your cabling, don't complain to me when you start a fire. Now, for the controller, I'm using an ESP32 development board for its Wi-Fi capabilities, as I don't want to connect this to my PC directly. And also, it's fast enough and has enough memory to do the job for the amount of LEDs I'm running. Connection wise from the board, I have a VIM connected to the power on the first strip, the ground connected to the ground, and the D13 pin to the strip's data. Now onto the code for the controller development board. It's pretty straightforward and I'm using the Arduino IDE to code it up. Again, just to note, this is a prototype, so it's bare bones just to get code working right now. Expect a lot of changes once I start rolling games onto this display. Now I'm using the Adafruit Nanopixel library for controlling these LEDs and the standard Wi-Fi library which you can find more of in the Node MCU 32S examples. First things first, I set the pin for the data out which as mentioned previously is 13. Next I set the relevant SSID and password for the Wi-Fi which as you can see here as the obligatory covering up. Then it's the Wi-Fi server being set up with port 80 and setting up the Adafruit NeoPixel strip with 1024 LEDs, the pin, and the strip setup. In the setup routine, we set the pin mode for the data pin and get working on connecting it to our Wi-Fi. To finish the setup, we set the strip to be off. The loop is also straightforward, as at this prototype stage, all we do is check for a client, and if one exists and is available, we start reading the input. So first we check the input for two commands, which I set using the fourth character or the alpha from a color 32 breakdown, which you'll see soon from the Unity code. Now I won't be using this alpha channel, 
So I can use this character as a B for the brightness command and with the value of the brightness set to the R value. And then if the alpha is set to the character C, I clear the display. If we don't have commands being set, we move on to the setting of the pixels one by one. I have the counter here to tell me when they are all received and then I hit the show command for the strip to display all the pixels that we've just passed. Just to note, if you set show after each pixel, it's going to be really slow. All this code of course will change and will be more optimized when we move on to version 1. With the controller code out of the way, let's move on to Unity. Here we have three classes of interest. First, we start with the display device class. This deals with connecting to the display and sending the information. I made it a scriptable object so I could serialize the IP address and the port. The first three functions deal with controlling the display itself. We have a simple send, which right now is just moving on a byte array to the output. We have a clear display function, which sends a single byte with the C character we saw from the controller code. Lastly, we have a set brightness command, which sends a B character and a specified value in the R slot. The next three functions are around the networking, without all the niceties because this is a prototype and we just want to turn this over. We connect using a simple TCP client and get the stream in the first function. The second deals with disconnecting for when we are done. And the last is writing bytes onto the stream. Now this is a real bare bones of a display class. The next class is another bare bones affair for device managing, which we will beef out later to control multiple displays, receive and control state for said displays. The functionality here takes a display device, which we just went over, and a render capture, which we'll come to after this script. In this class, we control taking what we want to display and sending it to display we are interested in. We have functionality for sending and clearing, which at present we control with a custom inspector. And it also has the option for refreshing the display periodically on a set refresh rate. So nothing fancy here. Now there are multiple ways to capture the game display. One is to have a camera in the scene that renders out to a render texture stored in our project. And then we read that render texture to get the resultant colors for our display. But instead what I've done here is use the on render image function to capture the render texture directly and then process it. Once we have this render texture, we read the pixels into a texture 32. And then from that texture, we get the array of pixels into a color 32 array. Now, something to point out here, getting the render texture into a texture 32 requires setting the render texture we got from the on render image function into the current active render texture. But make sure to set that active render texture back after you're finished with it. To get the byte array that we send to the display, we need to get a handle to the managed colors array, which we can get then copy into our byte array. I set up the capture texture and byte array ahead of time as I know their sizes and it gives me a little optimization. Now we have gone over the code, let's look at our scene. We have a camera with a render capture script. Note its size of 16 and it's set to orthographic. This will give us the output we need. Next, we have a manager game object housing our device manager component. This has entities for the render capture, but also the device which we created in the project view and set its IP and port values. The last elements are all to do with examples to display. And here we have just some tests of static images, animated images, and some 3D objects. I have set up a timeline on a playable director just to activate and deactivate these elements for testing, which you can see running here. So what's in store for the future? Well, the prototype proved to me that it would do the job I wanted it for, which is some background display, as well as some fun little game experiments I have planned for it. I won't just be using Unity for the display, I plan on creating a lightweight application to simply sway what's displayed and also be able to set up some queue which will continually run on display even when it's not connected to an application running on my PC. I will also link this lightweight application to my Stream Deck for quick usage. Hardware wise, I plan on 3D printing a better frame, taking the wiring from the breadboard and creating a custom control box. I also have a dedicated power adapter that's a little bit more capable and I plan to rewire the strips to use this. 
Lastly, I will fit a low profile shelf to display it on my back wall. I could have mounted it to the wall, but I will probably want to swap it out from time to time. So that's everything to do with the prototype summed up in this brief video. Don't see this as a tutorial, but more of a development log that I plan to continue with each iteration. So if you enjoyed it and you haven't already subscribed, maybe consider doing so, so you don't miss the future videos on this project. And if you really enjoyed this video, maybe hit the like button to spread the word. And as always, thanks for watching.